All right, thank you for so much for coming to tonight's event here at Palestine of Books. Uh, before we get started, I wanna remind you that you can keep up, keep up with us on all forms of social media, including Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Some of the exciting events that we have coming up include Emily St. John Mandel, Douglas Stewart, Chloe Codwell, and many more. You can check out the rest of our enticing lineup by going to our website, pals.com. Starting now, well, it's technically starting at the end of this month, but starting now. <laughs> we have also begun doing an assortment of in-person events as well. So when looking at the events page, please note whether it says virtual or list the store location because we don't want you to be disappointed. All right, tonight we are so excited to welcome Jeff Jump, but it's Jeff Jump's two pals. Uh, Jeff is the director of Chicago Seminary Co-op Bookstores, which in 2019, he helped incorporate as the first not-for-profit bookstore whose mission is book selling. He lives in Chicago, as you know. Uh, Jeff is here to discuss his new book, In Praise of Bookstores. And can we just say that this is a very beautiful book? We're very pleased to have it. Um, this book asks the question, do we need bookstores in 21st century? If so, what makes a good one? In his beautifully written book, in praise of bookstores, Jeff pays loving tribute to one of our most important and endangered civic institutions. He considers how qualities like space, time, abundance, and community find expression in a good bookstore. Along the way, he also predicts a future in which bookstores not only endure, but realizes the highest expectations, aspirations. And exploring why books, this, <laughs> exploring why good bookstores matter, he also draws on his lifelong experience as a bookseller, but also his upbringing as an Orthodox Jew. The spiritual and cultural heritage instilled in him a revengeance, reverence, sorry, for reading, but not, sorry, for reading not as a means to a living, but as an essential part of a meaningful life. Central among Deutsch audience for arguments for the necessities of bookstores is the value of browsing. Since we are deep in the act of looking at the shelves, we move through space as though we are inside the mind itself, immersed in self-reflection. In the age of one-click shopping, there's no ordinary defense of bookstores, but rather an urgent account of why the central places of discovery, refuge, and fulfillment that enrich the communities that are lucky to have them. We'll be joined in conversation with Ada Calhoun. Uh, Ada Calhoun is the New York Times bestselling author of St. Mark's is Dead, Wedding Toast I'll Never Give, and Why We Can't Sleep. Her newest book, also a poet, Frank O'Hara, My Father and Me, will be out in June. Uh, tonight's event will include a Q&A portion, so please ask any questions down in the Q&A box below instead of in the chat so that Ada will be able to find them a lot faster. If you have any questions that you'd also like to know the answer to, please click the like button so she'll know that this is a question that isn't to be missed. Uh, I'll be dropping the links to both Jeff and Ada's books in the chat during tonight's event, so please make sure to click on those links to support them in Powell's books. Now, please give a warm welcome to Jeff Dutch and Ada Cahoon. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and thanks to Jeremy, who is off screen, who is our wonderful tech support tonight. Um, and thanks, Jeff, for having me um, host you. Um, everybody, please do put questions in the chat. Um, just fill it up. I'll keep an eye on it um, the whole time we're talking. We'll talk for a you know, half hour or so. And then I just want to um, help Jeff with questions from all of you. Um, so I wanted to start out by saying that you're very popular in the, the book world. Um, I have always always heard very fond things from publishers and other booksellers about you. Um, and I wanted to quote something that you have in the book from Walt Whitman. I and mine do not convince by arguments, similes, rhymes, we convince by our presence. And I think that is true of books and bookstores, um, but also of you. And you've become a kind of ambassador for bookstores this month. Um, it's your first book and your first tour. And I'm curious about how it feels being on the other side of things, um, what have you learned? Um, thank you for that question. And thank you so much for doing this. It's really special uh, to be in conversation with, with you in particular and to have uh, this sort of conversation with somebody who is a, a tremendous literary citizen and thinks about the ecosystem quite a bit. I'll also say that Powell's is one of my favorite bookstores in the country and has been for 25 years now since I first visited. And you've got uh, Moe's books in the background there and yeah. uh, Berkeley, which is uh, also uh, one of my favorite stores. And so thinking about um, your kind words are, are uh, humbling and it's really not something I ever wanted to, to do, right? Most of us get into this because we wanna be shopkeeps and we wanna help customers and break a sweat by you know, unloading boxes and uh, shelving books and that sort of thing. And uh, I had hoped that I would get through my career by just doing the work of book selling. Uh, and alas and alack, it is now uh, a moment when I think we need to defend, uh, unfortunately, or articulate, I should say, the, the work that we do and the value of it. And so I am, 
stepping into that moment, uh, not reluctantly, with you know, um, very proud to do it, um, but hoping that in, you know, I can not only retire from a bookstore, but that I can shop at Powell's and Moe's and the seminary co-op um, in 40 years, you know, when I'm 80. That's great. Yeah, I heard um, on, on the trail, you have uh, tried to stock shelves and pull pickup orders um, other booksellers exactly have said, right. no, 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 you're the you're the, the author today. That's right. Um, I'm much more comfortable running tech on, a, on an event like this or setting up chairs than I am uh, on the other side of it. But I'm proud, yeah. I'm proud to be doing it. Proud to be doing it. Yeah. Um, so one line in the book I like a lot is we don't need another lamentation. Um, and I think I found that very refreshing. I think readers, uh, readers will because we know there's a lot of bad news and we've heard it all and it starts to feel a little oppressive. Um, and your book is so joyful and celebratory. Um, you have a line, we oscillate between the illusion of perfection and the vertigo of the unattainable. And you quote um, Borges, nothing is built on stone, everything on sand, but our duty is to build as if sand were stone. Um, is this secretly a book about religion? <laughs> um, it's a... Uh... Uh, that's a great question. I, I, before I answer that, I, I, and I, I want to answer that, um, it, you know, you mentioned three quotes in the question, and um, for any reader who um, hasn't seen the book yet, it, it it's uh, trying to um, replicate the experience of the browse uh, and bring mm -hmm. the reader into what happens when you're just pulling books off the shelf and um, and you know gazing at a line here or a poem there or even just looking, you know, smelling the book or looking at uh, you know how how it, seeing how it feels or whatever. Um, and uh, you just shared like three of my, like to me, the most inspiring uh, lines I've ever read. I mean, nothing is built on stone, everything on sand, but our duty is to build as if sand were stone. I, I've been carrying that around for 25 years. Uh, it comes out of a Borges poem. Uh, and I, I, I feel like that's the sort of thing that one only stumbles upon. Uh, there, it's not something that, um, you know, is necessarily uh, you know, easy to find out in the world. Uh, you have to just stumble upon it. Um, is it a, secretly a book about religion? Uh, I, it's certainly a book with a strong religious bent. Uh, and I will say that as someone who was raised in a culture that valued piety and loving kindness and uh, the sacred qualities of language itself, and uh, which is Orthodox Judaism is where I, I come out of, uh, the book itself, the Torah, is literally written in God's language with God's grammar. Uh, so that, that is the, the reverence that I was raised with. Um, and I, I think that some people have a talent for faith or a talent for doubt, like those sorts of qualities. And I definitely have a talent for reverence. Uh, I, 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 I have like a tremendous um, draw to sacred qualities. And I'd like to think it's leavened by a healthy skepticism. I'm not a believer. Um, but if I tend one way or another, it's really toward reverence and devotion. Uh, and so I do bring that to bear on the book itself. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so you talk in the book about books of the hour versus books of all time um, and how there are at all times good and necessary examples of both those things. I'm wondering if you can give an example of each of them from your own life. Um, so one book that was of a moment in time and then one that's in your canon. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, the idea comes from uh, John Ruskin actually who, who writes about reading and writes about how um, a, book of, a book of the hour and a book of all time are not, they're not necessarily good or bad. There are good books of the hour and good books of all time. Um, I, I, I will share, there's a book that I read when I was really just the perfect age, um, which was Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance um, oh. by Robert Persig. And I, uh, I don't think I could handle it today. I don't think I could have handled it even 20 years ago. I read it uh, maybe, maybe almost 30 years ago now, and it was just perfect. Now, it's a book that has endured. There are plenty of people even today who read it. Uh, we sell a lot of copies of it, uh, but it's not a book that I necessarily um, could have, uh, I think I could have come to today in the same way. Um, there was a book that I am, a, I'm gonna give a third category, which are books that I am not sure if they're books of the hour or books of all time, but I don't wanna go back and reread it uh, to find out. Uh, and it's a book that I loved when it was published in the late 90s. I just started in book selling. It's called Flaming Iguanas by Erica Lopez. And I don't even know what it is. It is like a part novel, part graphic novel, part, uh, it's just a lot of attitude. Uh, and it's about a motorcycle gang. Um, 
uh, girl, a girl gang, motorcycle gang. And I just thought it was the greatest. And I read that there was a sequel to it. I think they call me Mad Dog. Uh, and it's just all attitude and it's really fun. And I'm afraid yeah. to reread it. I'm afraid if I reread it, I would just hate it. Um, but then a, a book of all time that I read uh, probably also about 20 years ago that I've reread and marked up and it's actually out of print, I think, or in limited circulation, unfortunately, is a book by the Spanish dramatist uh, Ramon de Valle Inclán called The Lamp of Marvels. And it's a collection of aesthetic meditations that I think any writer, I mean, you know, anyone who thinks deeply about poetry and language uh, uh, would, would love. Um, and uh, and it, it's just this uh, like incredibly uh, abstract take on what, what you know, aesthetic, like what, what builds the aesthetic sense and mm -hmm. actually a lot of reverence. Now that I think about it, there's a lot of religion in it as well. And you'd get no sense of this reading his plays, his plays of none of this quality. Uh, and in that way, it's kind of like um, Clarice Lispector's Agua Viva, uh, which is another book that's just this oh. dense, these are like really beautiful uh, aesthetic meditations that uh, you know really don't have any bearing on her work otherwise. Um, Anyway, I'm rambling. You got a bookseller talking about book recommendations. I could go it's on. It's very dangerous. Whole, whole I, I walked right into it. Yeah, exactly. um, and speaking of booksellers being on top of it, Catherine is putting links, I just noticed, to all the books you're mentioning in the chat. Um, so I hope everybody buys Jeff's book, um, which there's a, from Powell's tonight. There's a link to it. And then also um, do some shopping on the Powell's website, which is wonderful. Um, OK, so speaking of shopping, the place not to buy the book is Amazon, um, which was founded in 1994, uh, the same year you became a bookseller. And I think people might be surprised um, to know that you didn't graduate from college. I was really surprised having, after reading the book, I thought like, oh, you know, where'd he go? Princeton, which is, the book is um, put out by Princeton University Press. Uh, in fact, no. Um, so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. I sort of found it consoling also as a parent of a child who's like about to go to college. Or it's like, oh, he'll be fine if it doesn't, you know, pan out. Um, so can you talk about your experience in yeshiva and maybe the role that bookstores and libraries played in your education? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And also, I'm just curious in general, like if it was a struggle to figure out how much of all that to include in the book, I mean, I, I like the memoir stuff was so compelling. Uh, I mean, but the but the quoting them from the other books was so compelling. So it's I can see it would have been hard to figure out the balance. I mean, I would assume. Yeah, um, there's a lot in that question. So I, I want. I know get, it's like four questions. I'm it's sorry. Like four okay. questions. So I'm going to yeah, start sorry. with a correction, which is that, take whichever ones you want. Well, uh, uh, first, I'm going to begin with a correction, which is not that I, I didn't graduate from college. I basically didn't go to college, and there's a difference in that. It was. Uh, I went for a semester uh, and I didn't make it even through the semester, much less the four years or anything beyond. Um, and there's a personal element to that that I think is really important, but I also think there's a professional element to it that's important. Um, so if you wanna hit both of them and then you asked about the memoir part, let, I'll come back to the memoir part. That's, uh, that's yeah, that was tough. Um, yeah, so it's, it's like the culture that I come, come from uh, was really more interested in yeshiva learning uh, than secular education. We didn't. Uh, uh, have much truck with any any secular education at all. And I think there's an important distinction that exists in that world between being learned and being educated. Uh, and you know where I come from, being learned is everything. There is no such thing as being educated. Um, no one graduates uh, and then is educated and stops learning. Like that's not a thing. Uh, everyone strives to become learned. They want uh, the learning to be part of their daily practice because in order to live a meaningful life, learning is a crit the critical part of it, uh, or a critical part of it, along with um, loving your family and, uh, and you know, doing good works in the community and things like that. Um, the notion that we are like with a certain amount of credit hours, a student is suddenly declared educated and like it's done, and then they can focus on making a living, is anathema to the, the culture that I come from. Uh, and I can even share like a brief anecdote, a, a dear friend of mine, um, whose anon anonymity I'll retain for the sake of the community, was accepted to Harvard when we were in high school. And I, I'm not making a joke when I tell you that it was actually a disappointment to their parents um, that they were going there and not yeshiva uh, because that's that was a secular world we don't need to do that that doesn't make any sense um, so for me it was uh, it was clear when I was uh, you know deciding what to do with my life that I just wanted to be around books all the time I wanted to be around readers and that was like the most critical part of um, why I wanted to learn uh, and that was not about making a living 
Now for the professional side of it, I think this is actually important and it's important to the, the one message in the book, if there is one um, beyond just a, a you know, walk through the store, is that uh, historically, uh, so many of our best booksellers, and I'm not like, going back generations, but even today, um, they're, they're academic misfits like I am. I mean, people who, uh, and some of them were PhD dropouts, but they're still consider themselves dropouts. Uh, and um, because there isn't that professional track in bookselling, there isn't that uh, sense that, well, actually what we do is of tremendous value. And there is a profession here that we have trained in, that we have expertise in that is of value that should be paid for in a way that's not just retail. And not that there's anything wrong with retail, retail is amazing, but um, retail is considered a, a different different kind of trade. Um, and, you know, it's I appreciate that it surprised you that I, I didn't go to a school like Princeton or whatever. Um, uh, but I, I also will say that, that like what you learn in a bookstore and in a library, that is the concentrate of knowledge. Uh, and, uh, and what you learn from booksellers is really powerful as well. I happen to have spent most of my adult life on college campuses. So in the last 15 years, I was at UC Berkeley and Stanford and uh, University of Chicago. And I suddenly have those on my resume, even though I, and I've taken classes, but like I've not, I haven't done any credits in any of them. And to me, like the notion of uh, an education in the university environment is, it really is about being among books, being in dialogue, uh, you know, thinking about things that might be a little bit bigger than just the moment. Uh, and that to me is a critical part of what booksellers do, no matter what, uh, whether they're college campuses or not. And I think that that professionalization is so important and that booksellers who have historically been like humble and, um, you know, maybe there's some self-doubt about, well, do I belong here in these conversations can really and should really uh, embrace the unique values that they bring to their communities. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I'm gonna make you read something. Are you ready? No, I wanna answer your memoir question. Can I answer your memoir question? You can answer my memoir question first. Yes, go ahead. Okay, good. Um, okay. So I didn't wanna tell any stories about myself. I was not interested in telling any stories about myself. And uh, my editor was amazing and said, this is really nice, but you've gotta tell more about yourself. We need to, we need to meet you. Uh, and I ended up talking more about uh, you know, the, the Orthodox Jewish background and things of that sort, um, reluctantly. And I think that, you know, someone, you know, your books are fantastic and you have an amazing, amazing book coming out uh, in June called Also a Poet uh, about Frank O'Hara and your father and your relationship to your father uh, that I was really lucky to read early on. And actually it came up last night uh, when I was at an event in Seattle, Elliot Bay with a great bookseller who said, oh my God, I can't believe you're getting to talk to Ada Calhoun tomorrow. This book was amazing. Uh, and, and the way that you write about your life and find meaning in it, uh, it is really impressive. I don't know how to do that. So what I know how to do is just get enthusiastic about books and think about like some of these quotes that I love and uh, the books that have mattered to me and uh, and like kind of like the big ideas that I have nothing interesting to say necessarily, but I like to kind of like reflect on and um, turn over. So I will. I don't know how to write a memoir, but uh, I, I look forward to to reading more of yours as they come out. <laughs> Well, the, the memoir um, pieces of this book are really wonderful, especially the stuff about growing up Orthodox in Borough Park. It's just really, um, really lovely. Okay, now I'm gonna make you read. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, I'm also ready. could everybody please put questions in the chat, just ask anything. Um, we both like questions and you should add them into the chat. Um, okay, uh, I just want you to, to, I want people to get a sound of the, uh, just a sense of the sound of the book because it's really quite, magical. Um, so could you start on page 149, please? Great. This is out of the, the time chapter. So the book is broken up into five sections, uh, beginning with space, moving into abundance, then value, then community, and then time. Um, <clears throat> uh, in his essay, ex uh, sorry, excuse me. Um, at its best, a serious bookstore inspires uh, this engagement. It strives to create a space that values slow time. It privileges attention above sensation, recognition above seduction, and it privileges good books of the moment and of all time by children of their time, as well as begetters of ages. And finally, it privileges records and expressions of the enduring and ephemeral that are worthy of encounter. 
In his essay, Experience, written after he suffered great personal loss, Ralph Waldo Emerson wonders, if any of us knew what we were doing or where we are going than when we think we best know. We do not know today whether we are busy or idle. In times when we thought ourselves indolent, we have afterwards discovered that much was accomplished and much was begun in us. All our days are so unprofitable while they pass that tis wonderful where or when we ever got anything of this, which we call wisdom, poetry, virtue. We never got it on a dated calendar day. Some heavenly days must have been intercalated somewhere. Browsers uh, revel in this intercalated time. These moments are expansive. They're somehow not at the mercy of the clock. Here, the only urgency is the one created by the books themselves. The stacks are stuffed with them. Read one of those Lispector novels. She'll tell you of the instants that drip and are thick with blood. Browse the classic section. You'll know with Heraclitus that time is a child playing drafts. Pursue that bookseller's lead and you'll hear from Vey how in the inner life, time takes the place of space. Perhaps you will reflect upon your own capacity for thought. Pick up one of those translations of Confessions, perhaps Sarah Rudin's, and reflect upon the unfathomable repository of time. In you, my mind, I measure time. Don't shout me down with the protest that time is a thing in itself. Don't shout yourself down with a riot of your feelings. In you, I say, I measure time. And further down the page, you'll measure, along with Augustine, the silence. Thank you, that's so beautiful. Um, yes. We got our first question. Uh, it is from Jamie. Um, can you talk a bit about bookstores as places of refuge? It's such a good question. Um, I love it. And yeah, feel free to put them, that one's in the Q&A, but you can just throw it in the chat either place, just um, I'm watching both places. So yes, bookstores as places of refuge. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, right, there's something about that space and what's created there that is uh, private, is um, ruminative, is uh, uh, democratic, the doors are open. And so many of us go into a bookstore in search of ourselves. Uh, and so many of us have a daily practice of, of being in a space, a book line space. Um, I will say one of the things that's been um, remarkable about spending a career in a bookstore is the amount of work and the amount of frantic work that goes into creating that quiet environment, that uh, contemplative environment, um, and how enjoyable that part of it is. Uh, and there are many days uh, in the last 30 years that I, I recall seeing people come in kind of in search of themselves in that way. Uh, I, I speak about this a little bit in the epilogue, but you know what happened two years ago um, when we had a bunch of people coming into the space to find that, that refuge. And it was really, um, it, it was not comfortable. It was not, it did not feel uh, like, the, like a refuge, like safety. Uh, um, and the fact that we then shut down for us, it was for 400 plus days. And seeing that space without people, without uh, quiet uh, contemplative people uh, really showed the difference to me and to many of us between an online fulfillment center and a bookstore and what it means to have that space. Um, and so I, I, I won't get too into all of that, but um, I think that's an important question because if a bookstore is a refuge and is meant to be a certain kind of space, that's not uh, the same as being a retailer, um, which is come and go uh, as, as quickly as you can, make your purchase and move on. Uh, it's the reason that Amazon cl claimed like officially in their press release that they closed their bookstores is that they were functioning too much like bookstores uh, and, <laughs> and not retailers, right? They were saying that, well, people wouldn't come to buy something. They would just kind of wander in and browse and that, that didn't really work. I'm like, well, that's actually what a bookstore does. Uh, and how do we build models that support that unique thing that bookstores do? That's great. Um, I also have to say it's, this is, I don't know if, if anybody um, here is an author, but this book, if you are a writer, an author, it's like one of the best books you can possibly read. First of all, it gives you a sense of how booksellers are thinking about books, um, which is really just handy professionally, um, but also there's so much comfort available in it. Um, there's this one line, it takes at least 10 years for work of any really subtle quality to become widely known. Um, Toni Morrison's first few books had sales under 5,000 copies. 
Um, and you have so much affection for authors in the book and for creating space for a wide variety of authors and a wide spectrum of political and philosophical ideas. Um, and I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it so much until I read it um, in your book. And you, you said um, the Cal Calvin Report was something that you in interpreted um, in terms of how it, what it meant for bookstores. So I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit, um, just because I found it sort of profound, especially in this age where um, there's a sense of, of um, you want purity and you know in, in your spaces, and um, but you sort of argue for um, diversity of, of thought. Yeah, um, thanks for that, especially about the authors, and I think that. Um, like as an author, you you too, like you think about more than just the work you're doing um, and even just doing this tonight and being a part of an, like a literary world where, you know, you're giving back to you know, young writers and, and thinking about what it means to be a part of that that community is, is important. It's, it's an important part of what we do. Um, I think that there, uh, you know, I, I um, coming out of an orthodox world, I, one of the things I celebrate in the book and in the work I've been doing uh, all my career is the heterodoxy that is intrinsic in any, any bookstore. There is, uh, and it's just thinking about kind of what we gravitate toward and the sorts of books we gravitate toward in a given moment uh, and the arguments that we'll have with ourselves. I mean, I, uh, there have been many times when uh, Emerson, for example, wasn't right for me. I, you know, and I spent, I've been reading him since I'm 15 years old. Uh, I found out last night from a, a colleague that I used to work with in Seattle that he remembers me 20 years ago, hanging out in a cafe, reading Emerson. I thought, oh, okay, I guess I was reading him 20 years ago. That's great. Um, but I was also reading um, Flaming Iguanas. And, uh, and there, there's, we are all so diverse. Uh, we have so many different modes and moods and tendencies and it changes over time. And to be able to find things that we, um, disagree with and, and things that have a subtlety to the arguments and arguments we don't even know exist. Um, I'll share one example that I think is important um, in speaking to the Calvin Report in particular, um, which to share with the, the viewers, the Calvin Report is a 50 year old, uh, 55 year old report uh, that um, Harry Calvin, who was a legal scholar at the University of Chicago, uh, um, developed and it was a it was about the university not taking stances on issues. It was around the Vietnam War and there were protests and wanted to keep the university uh, out of making any statement on, on behalf of the government actually. Um, and the reason that was important to me is that his son, Jamie Calvin, who is a journalist who works on uh, behalf of police accountability and, and runs something called the Invisible Institute, which is an incredible organization um, and just recently won a, a major award for his work in uh, exposing the, uh, the police uh, brutality and, uh, and murders in, in Chicago. Um, he, has, he has believed for 25 years that bookstores and ours in particular are, um, community centers that actually speak to the community or, or rather uh, show the community who they are uh, in a way that no other institution can. And so that connection was, was important to me to, to make. Um, and in thinking about how, like the arguments that take place in bookstores, I mean, there are a lot of things that come up that we think we, we understand the issues involved, um, but I'll share one that, that uh, one of many that's come up for us that I didn't even really know the issue, um, which is, I, I feel like there, uh, there was a book uh, HarperCollins put out maybe six or seven years ago called The Battle for Sanskrit. Uh, and it was a, a argument on behalf of Sanskrit as the national language of India and, um, and that Hinduism can uh, you know, need Sanskrit and uh, that is the critical piece of it, which is really like the Modi government's uh, approach. And I had a furious customer who came in and just said, how dare you put that on the table? Uh, it feels really like, like, like this is not the argument we should be making as a bookstore. And I said, I, we don't make an argument as a bookstore other than putting, you know, putting these books together and our arguments are really more of uh, assemblages. Um, and there are things that we leave out for sure. But that book published by HarperCollins, written by a scholar, is three books away from Wendy Doniger's on Hinduism, which argues the exact opposite, makes the case that the Modi government is, uh, you know, that there's a, a heterodoxy that's important in India. And that argument that existed there, which I didn't feel at all um, capable of, you know, adjudicating in any way uh, beyond trusting the people who were involved in the book, that felt like a really important part of the work. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, how we learn about ourselves and think about ourselves is a really important 
part of the search for ourselves that a good bookstore hopefully leads us into and through. It's wonderful. Okay, um, our Q and A is blowing up. It's very exciting. Um, we have a lot of questions. I'm just going to ask a couple more. It's 8:30 now, and um, ask a couple more, and then I'm just going to start starting on those. Feel free to keep adding them um, in the Q and A. Uh, I was yes, you can do the, the chat too. I will see that, but Powell's would like you to do it in the Q and A. So please, please observe that role. Okay. Um, so book list start review. Quote, the bookseller, Deutsch argues, performs a sort of alchemy, organizing the space to facilitate seemingly serendipitous discovery, similar to the alchemy leading a reader to discover unexpected treasures within oneself. It's lovely, lovely review, very true. Um, one thing that I thought was so great is you insist that we stop apologizing for the inefficiencies of good book selling. Um, you basically say, and I thought this was very revolutionary, making money is just um, it's not, it's not a thing that's going to happen <laughs> if you're really doing a good job, probably. Um, and of the 28,000 titles the seminary co-op sold in 2019, 17,000 were single copies, which completely blew my mind. So bought by a unique reader. Um, and this actually echoes a question I just saw in there about the, the, the community. Um, when you're talking about the role of a bookstore as part of a community, you quoted Marilyn Robinson, who I love, about how a community creates a sense of the possible. Um, I'm wondering if you can just talk about the sense of the possible and and what is possible for bookstores given that maybe making piles of money is not one of those things. Right, right. Yeah, it's an astute, um, astute question. In part because, I mean, the idea that uh, we would set up a structure for bookstores that is built on an inherited model of retail, uh, which is buying something at cost and then reselling it at list and the difference between those two is how we make our living um it just it doesn't make any sense at all uh the books that we carry we have a hundred thousand books on the shelf um which are fewer than what powell's has powell's is again one of, like one of the great bookstores that we've ever had um and i'm yeah. like thrilled that it's still it's still thriving um but we have a hundred thousand books on the shelf and those books that the, the what you quoted uh was a real, really amazing um it's amazing number to think that 17,000 books can sell one like one copy to one person. So it's it's still a good uh, business proposition in the sense that people want these books. They, they aren't on the shelf because um, we just are precious about what we carry and we want to have like a store that is you know idiosyncratic. They're, they're, they're books that people want. And if they're on the shelf, they're discovered. Uh, that's important and that's powerful and we should find ways to finance it. Um, more than i mean for many reasons but one of the main reasons is that the community that's built to your the, and think, thinking marilyn robinson's quote around those ideas and around those uh you know, singular uh, expressions of humanity these single and it could be poetry or, or literature but it also could be ideas uh and uh, other other works that they speak to the individual in us and uh, as somebody whose identity in many ways was predicated upon a break with uh, a groupthink uh, and a notion that we all can kind of understand ourselves by becoming more like uh, like whatever the, the status quo or um, the masses or whatever. It's like, it's, that's just not the case. And that's not why so many of us go go to these books. Um, and so I, I, I hope that there are more stories. And I, I've spent, um, I went to Powell's uh, for uh, two days and spent probably eight to 10 hours each day there. And I could have spent a full week there. Uh, and I would love to go back and spend a full week just browsing those shelves. I, you know, I spent a lot of time in Moe's uh, over the years. And, uh, um, and I feel like that, that store I could, I can't do it justice in two days. You know, I need to spend more time. And, and part of it is that, like, it's just that there are books that even to someone like me who've spent my life in books, I'm still blown away by what I find on the shelf and what I discover and what it means to actually have books in front of me that I, hadn't seen in a while and maybe forgot that I wanted to read at some point. Um, so anyway, I, I'm totally rambling. There is no, no, hope, that was great. There's no hope for a retail <laughs> model of book selling as far as I'm concerned, certainly not to support stores that only sell books. And I, well, yeah. I'm going to interrupt you because um, Paula has a question related mm -hmm. to this. Thoughts on bookstores also selling things other than books, socks, pottery, DVDs, et cetera, et cetera, to help their bottom line. Yeah, it's great. I, I'm all for it. I'm 100% for it. Um, I think that any bookstore that 
is making it work is worthy of our um, respect. And there are a lot of ways people make it work, you know, cafes and bars. And uh, there's a bookstore that has a travel agency uh, that does literary travel internationally. Um, there are stores, that, a lot of stores do real estate. They make their living on real estate. Huh. Uh, yeah. you buy your building in the seventies and you're going to do really well. Uh, so that's the model for a lot of bookstores. Uh, I don't know if pa Powell's, I don't know the model there. I don't know how used books work, but I, I'm, I'm fairly certain that that building is, uh, um, is a part of it. And I, and I, I think that's great. Uh, my, uh, argument, and I have like one or two arguments in the book. My argument is that it should not be an economic necessity to sell something other than books in order to sell books. And it shouldn't be an economic necessity to sell books that aren't necessarily of the community uh, in order to support the books that are. And there are so many, there's, there is no store in the 21st century that can make a living selling books alone. And I think that that is, like, that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book is to say, this is a problem. We have something that's really like one of the most powerful cultural institutions in the world. And we are not building a model to support it. Uh, we are paying ridiculously low wages because it's retail and retail has very low wages and our margins are terrible. We are not building a professional track to build up new booksellers. I don't know what will happen to the future of Powell's, the future of Seminary Co-op, if we don't have uh, a profession uh, that raises up booksellers, keepers of book palaces. And uh, that is my hope that we can do that and not have to sell socks and merchandise and coffee and uh, not have to have uh, real estate, which no one, no one can afford if they're in their 20s or 30s. Now, what can we do to create this profession? Well, okay, so you mentioned real estate, which I think um, provides a segue to Lauren's question. Um, do you think that the pandemic and the increase in the virtual events um, such as this have increased the sense of community or has it fragmented it? Um, I, that's a great question. I, I've gone back and forth on it. Um, and really, I, uh, ultimately, I think that it has increased community in the sense that it has reminded all of us, uh, so pulling the virtual events out of it, uh, it has reminded all of us how interconnected we all are and how you really can't pull whether it's you know delivery drivers or uh, oh and we I said we were coming to work every day for you know March 2020 we came to work 45 people in a physical environment moving books around trying to figure out how to keep each other safe um, and there were people in our community said well you know these books like we're not, we need to get get them to our homes as quickly as possible and I said great they're people who are doing that work. And I think a lot of, uh, of the community realized that uh, delivery drivers and, uh, and wholesalers and all of that were um, having to show up every day. But what I do think is also important, especially on virtual events, and I've now been uh, um, you know, a couple of weeks into a book tour where I've done a lot of in-person in events. And for a lot of these stores, it's the first month that they're doing it. It's been really special to be out there. And so, so many people are just thinking, my God, I'm like, I'm with other people again and I, able to like linger and talk about books. And, you know, uh, Jeff's a little bit boring right now. So I'm gonna like, my eyes are gonna wander and like scan the shelves because there's some cool books that I wanna check out when we're done. But whatever the case is, like those spaces are really important. and. If we ended up being a um, an online like a warehouse, uh, and we've always done a lot with our website, we ship globally, and I've had a large global audience. We lovingly call the diaspora people who come and go, and then we want to keep them involved in the co-op. If we did that, it, it, it's not worth saving. And if we ended up doing virtual events in general as like our default and not bring people together in physical spaces where they can have serendipitous conversations among the stacks with the people who show up and with the authors and share like the beautiful stories with the authors and, and uh, interlocutors and others, then I, we're, we're gonna lose something that is something that only we can do. Um, so I love the virtual events. I've been able to see authors that I'd never thought I'd see uh, otherwise, but I don't think, I hope that's not our future. Yeah, yeah I agree. Um, and I think that addresses Stephanie's question about community also. And just as far as the um, the virtual versus in-person event thing, something that I didn't really know until um, I think maybe Jeremy was just talking about, that the um, they, you sell a lot more books in person. I guess it's because you're actually with the author and you can like, you know, see them and have your book signed and everything. But um, but it's interesting. I think it's like a tenth or something of the book sales for um, not not that's not what we do it. We do it because we love it and we like talking to each other. Um, but I'm gonna put your the link to your book in the chat again 
because if you can buy it tonight from Powell's, it makes a difference. Um, and I know we're not in person, but we can pretend we are. Karen has a question. She said, can Jeff address the history of the front table at the seminary co-op? How did it become such a famous feature of the bookstore? Yeah, um, good. Uh, somebody uh, who's uh, clearly spent time in the stores. Uh, it, it's a weird thing, the front table. Um, so it's you know, capital F, capital T front table. It's uh, seen that way by my many in the community. And we used to have, uh, still, still do actually, have people who argue, authors who argue with each other uh, about whether or not they can outlast the other on the front table. And we've had um, people who are, you know, best in their field, um, uh, you know, world-class intellectuals who ju they just want that book on the front table for as long as possible. It's, it's seen that way. Um, you know, it's, it's really a reflection of, um, of the community and it's a reflection of uh, what like the conversation is uh, right now. And so um, we'll see, like I mentioned Augustine and the, um, the, the piece that you had me read, uh, that was a, a time when there were two new translations of Confessions. And uh, you know Augustine is um, fighting for space um, with Albert Rabateau's new book on um, you know liberation theology in the 20th century, and uh, but also books on atheism and books on politics and books on literary theory, um, philosophy, things of that sort, uh, and, and to see the difference and or rather the the multiplicity of, of perspectives in one place, it speaks to kind of what we do when we're at our best and the hope with the front table is that um and this is true for you know many front tables i think for the uh, for the audience um to be clear we are we are focused on academic titles academic and scholarly titles and uh, books uh, literary books of enduring worth and uh you know there are many bookstores that will have um you know similar new, re new releases let's say you know this week it's you know, ocean vong and emily st john mandel these amazing amazing books that are coming out um at the seminary co-op you walk in that's actually not what you see um, and we carry all of those books with great joy um we hosted ocean uh last week and then it's really special as always um but these are books that are idiosyncratic they're published by university presses or smaller presses or larger presses but really interesting um works and and we look for these books that are unlike any other they're almost uh, and i'm speaking to an author who does this kind of work like they're almost their own genre Right. I mean, so for anyone who has not pre-ordered also a poet, uh, pre-order that because it really it's like it's unclassifiable, the book. And so where, where would we put some of these books and 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 when will it no longer be relevant? Right. Uh, and so so much so much of the book industry is built upon seasons. That, you know, my book happened to have published, so it's going to have a few months as a season. Uh, and then if it doesn't make it, the point about Toni Morrison uh, didn't make it those first few books. Well, the, the books didn't work. Uh, and it doesn't matter what happened that season. It doesn't matter that, you know, 9-11 happened. I think Ann Patchett's uh, Bel Canto came out right when, uh, on September 10th, I think, um, or September 11th. And uh, th that doesn't matter. What matters is that it didn't make it. It like had its expiration date and it's over. Uh, we don't quite do it that way. And, um, you know, we've had, for instance, there's a wonderful, wonderful book um, called Ghosts in the Schoolyard that Eve Ewing uh, put out a few years ago that was on our front table for probably three years. And it was a book about wow. school closures, public school closures and the failure of um, the city of Chicago to, to, to support uh, the South side of Chicago, black and brown communities and figure out ways to, uh, you know, build an educated, uh, an educated populace. And that book sat, it was on our front table for uh, years uh, as it should have been um, and then there are others that come and go uh, and that anyway I'm totally rambling about the front table I just want to like take everyone in the audience like I'll walk on the front <laughs> table like grab by the hand and like get all excited about what's out there um, but well there's yeah. and there's a newsletter there's a wonder seminary co-op has a great um, newsletter for everybody who wants to see the front table in a virtual way in their inbox they should sign up for that yeah. newsletter okay. um, and we just we have an anonymous attendee who said thought not question um, I so enjoy the virtual as there are bookstores I cannot physically get to, authors I want to hear, but I order accordingly. So everyone be like the anonymous <laughs> attendee, order Jeff's book. Um, uh, okay, so somebody else, another anonymous attendee said, do you find these same qualities of bookstores in other countries? I'm actually curious about that. I've never thought about it. Um, is it. Is it a universal? Like what makes a good bookstore? Are there things that different countries do differently mm -hmm. that you've noticed? Yeah, I mean, this might get a little bit to um, like on the professional side of it, but I, I think it's important. Um, so we 
we live in a world now, and we certainly in our country, um, the largest seller of books by far is not a bookseller. And that's Amazon. Um, they sell books, but they don't actually have the qualities that booksellers bring to their work. And um, I, I speak to those qualities in the book. It's things like filtration and selection and assemblage, enthusiasm. None of that happens on Amazon. Um, and if they were booksellers, then they would think about the full ecosystem and what it means. Um, even speaking to the the, the point that was made uh, by the co the comments. Uh, and even like us trying to say like buy books from Powell's and I would say buy any books from Powell's buy whatever don't buy you know buy my book sure but like buy whatever books from Powell's because you should support support, support these stores um, but what it like part of that is that publishers have will send authors out on tour to promote the book and um, are looking for some return on investment and uh, if we don't sell books well or turn people out then uh, we don't get those authors and that totally makes sense However, um, is that really the point of, uh, of the bookstore? Like if, and, and with virtual author tours, like, right, let's just do virtual author tours and not, not worry about the book sales. Let's, let's bring authors to the communities. Um, and one of the things that I'm gonna get to the point about other countries in a minute, I'm super rambly, I apologize. Um, but if we, you know, if we think about like, uh, so we work with uh, plenty of community organizations. One of them is called My Very Own Library uh, in Chicago and they're amazing. And we had an ama amazing author event with Tomi Ediemi, who is a you know, brilliant young writer um, who is incredibly popular. And as part of it, we said, well, we're gonna do something in the community and, but also we wanna bring those authors into the schools and bring them to, to public schools. And in particular places that might not be able to, you know, um, rent a bus or anything like that. And so we, we found the money, we raised the money with my very own library to do that. Uh, and it's the kind of thing that, again, like Amazon, whether they would do it or not is, is beside the point. They're not in their communities in that way and they're not working with, with um, local partners. Um, so that, that is one important part of it. And uh, thinking about what if we were not retailers and it was seen as a cultural organization and it was seen as a uh, work separate from selling books and more about creating book spaces and bringing book culture into our communities, that would be much different. So uh, France, for example, has uh, on the books, they have a law that it cannot discount books more than 5% because these are cultural treasures. And so there is no undercutting. Amazon sells there. They don't do as well there because the community uh, or the, you know, the, the government and the community, they, they really support and care about bookselling and booksellers. And there is a professional track where booksellers go through certification and that's how they develop the next generation of booksellers. It's seen as a noble profession, which I deeply believe it is mainly because I spent 30 years doing it. And I've met some of the most brilliant, passionate, incredible people, including, you know, ma many people who've gone through Powell's um, and all the stores that uh, you know, I've been, I've been through, uh, you know, the last two weeks and the last 30 years. Uh, you mentioned that you're going to be at Porter Square Books in Cambridge. I was there two weeks ago, um, just shopping, just hanging out and shopping and uh, meeting with some of the booksellers there and incredible, incredible people uh, who are doing really special work with ridiculously low remuneration. And uh, what would happen if we built a different model. Um, so that, that's one example. Uh, and there, there are plenty of them. There, none of them are great. I, like there isn't an existing model that we'd want to point to. Even, you know, uh, what's still happening in France is not, it's not ideal. Um, there, there are accessibility questions and there are reasons why that model of uh, apprenticeship is, is, is problematic. Uh, let's start from scratch. And, and my hope is that we can start from scratch and say in 2030, we want a, a vibrant book selling community, what will it take to build deliberately a model for it that gets rid of the inherited retail model that we had, gets rid of all these notions about we have to sell books, we have to sell books quickly, you get three months and then it's over. Like, let's think differently about it and see what we can come up with. That's great. Okay. We have 10 minutes left, everyone, together. Um, I have a few questions from people. Um, first, somebody had a comment. Paula says, the other thing that makes Amazon not, in caps, a bookseller bookstore is their undercutting of prices. They are evil. Thank you, Paula, <laughs> for your comments. Um, okay, Richard Goldenhurst, who's a longtime Powell shopper, says and says that um, we, got, we are great. Thank you, Richard. Um, what is your position on ebooks, generic, not Amazon? Yeah, um, I, 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 can I just say, I, um, 
I don't think Amazon is evil. Um, and I'm going to say this, that the, um, my father, I love my father so much. I can't convince him that Amazon is not the place that he should go to, to buy books, uh, in part to save money, in part because it's convenient, in part because he likes watching movies on it and he likes getting dog food off it and all of that. So uh, I hear a lot of reasons people go to Amazon and I am, I'm not opposed to Amazon per se, I'm opposed to Amazon selling books and not being booksellers. And in that way, those are definitely evil actions. I, I, I agree. It, 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 to, uh, to use books, which is our great cultural heritage as uh, loss leaders, is it's it's ridiculous. Um, so that said, uh, so ebooks are amazing. Uh, uh, ebooks, I I have only read one, I think, in my life. Uh, I don't like the experience of it, um, and I but I think they're amazing. And you know, for anyone who like needs large print, uh, every book is large print and ebook. Um, for those who travel, who don't travel dumbly like I do and bring 12 books with me, of which I might read three pages of one on a trip, uh, they can bring their one light, light uh, e-reader. Uh, I think it's great. I think audiobooks are amazing. Audiobooks are like whatever, uh, whatever it takes to get the book into the reader's hand or ear is wonderful. It's part of why I, I don't think that bookstores should be about the sale of books per se. I think they should be about the discovery of books and bringing communities together in physical space to celebrate books and, and other readers. Uh, and so if we were able to do events and it was you know, about bringing people together, like it is for a university talk, for instance, uh, then that's enough. Uh, and we just need to find models to finance that and to bring people together over books. Um, there was an interesting thing that happened in speaking to like our, um, like the civic responsibility that we have for these institutions. Um, in San Francisco, Mayor Edley, who passed away uh, suddenly four or five years ago, he was working on a way to support financially the independent booksellers in San Francisco. And this is a city that has changed so much over the last 20 years. Uh, it's become so expensive and so hard to maintain uh, historic businesses like this. And they ended up, the municipality, that city gave $100,000 to 18, I think, bookstores, which if you do the math, it's not a lot of money per bookstore, but the notion that a, a city would fund their store or their historic bookstores in that way, it was, it was kind of revolutionary. And to think about what a the argument on behalf of public libraries would be if we didn't have them, if they didn't exist, and we go back 150 years, and you know I'm out there talking about you know oh we should get all this money for land to support public libraries, and anyone can just walk in and get a book off the shelf and borrow. And don't worry, publishers, like we'll figure out a way for you to be supported. But like it's just important for us to have this. Well, no one, I mean it would be a ridiculous proposition. Nobody would support it. Nobody would uh, think that this is something that we is realistic. And our, this is a much more modest idea. And I don't. I don't think it's ridiculous for us in the 21st century to acknowledge that that model was wrong and this model actually could contribute to a thriving populace. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we we are down to our last several minutes, everyone. So um, there are two kind of questions, well, there's three questions I'm gonna combine into two. Um, one, you mentioned libraries. Um, two people had this question, Janet is one of them. How is going to a bookstore different? Than going to a library and an anonymous attendee said how would libraries fit into the future model and just to prep you the next question will be about accessibility um, of bookstores so but first do the library one what, yeah. how is it different great um so in addition to um well so first of all libraries today i love libraries if i'm not in a new bookstore i'm usually at a used i'm usually at a used bookstore when i'm off or a new bookstore or a library i spend a lot of time there i discover a lot of books there um, and they're wonderful uh, if a library is doing their job really well the collection is always incomplete most of the books that um, are of interest to the community are hopefully in the homes of community members uh, and that idea of the collection what it means to wander the collection it, it doesn't exist in quite the same way um, for bookstores, if they're doing their job well and they're reordering quickly, the collection is essentially complete more or less every day. Uh, and that I, I think is a really important difference. Um, there is a crisis with libraries as there is with bookstores. Uh, libraries are like bookstores, need other things in their space that not just books. And there are amazing things that they do, things like you know tool lending libraries and you know, internet access and uh, makers labs and things like that. 
but those could be in a, in a community center and the library itself could be a space just for books. And that to me is, uh, is an ideal that I hope more libraries work toward their arguments on either side of it. Um, I'm no expert on it. It's my personal preference is that space is just for books. I think it, it's a different model and it's important. Um, I think that they're complementary. They've always been complementary. And there's a question about accessibility I, uh, um, that you mentioned that it, yes. it, I would have touched on anyway. Which did you see what it did you see what it was? No, it's from Lauren. It? No, okay, it's from Lauren. Lauren asks, how would you address areas that do not have bookstores? The closest bookstore to Lauren is over an hour away. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is why Amazon is not evil. Is like Amazon has done a great, great work getting books to people. Um, you can probably order from elsewhere too. Um, but yeah, exactly. I mean, stores, uh, the hope is in 20 years, every store that, every community that wants a bookstore has a bookstore because there's a model to support it. The reason there aren't more bookstores is because it's a really bad business model uh, and it's impossible to support. Um, and there are accessibility questions and, you know, books, should books be free? Should books, uh, right? And so someone like like you, A.D., you're, you're a, an author who makes a living as an author. Um, and no one is going to other tradespeople and saying, hey, we should just have your work for free. Um, like that, that is just not, it's not a model um, for keeping, keeping this going. And I, I think that there is a way, I mentioned my very own library, for example, to partner with organizations that work on accessibility. And they're the ones who are helping to fundraise and to think about bookstores as these democratic institutions, which they are, again, coming in and browsing, anyone can do it. Buying a book is a different conversation, but there are ways to support people to buy books. Um, let's have those conversations and not uh, conversations about books are too expensive. Um, I mean, the fact is the work that goes into creating a book um, and the work that goes into creating a couple of scones and a couple of cups of coffee are like the price tag is the same. It's the price okay. tag is the same. And we don't think twice about that part of it. And that's exactly right. There should be accessibility around uh, around books. Um, so let's figure that out. Uh, that's wonderful. OK, so uh, we have a recommendation for you. The Book Barn in Niantic, Connecticut, one of the best used bookstores I've ever been to. Jeff, if you have not, then you must go. It is an incredible literary destination. Have you been I, there? I have not, but I want to just point out in the back of the book of my book, there's a QR code that Princeton added that has a link to independent bookstores throughout the country. And so it's a really special thing to think about like where, where this book is purchased. And there are people who are buying it on Amazon and that's great. And people getting it from the library and audio versions, but um, where, where we buy it from is important. Uh, so. And, and, and Paula just said that. So you can easily order from an indie rather than Amazon. And Sue Diamond says, thank you. Another advantage virtually is being able to see people's comments and thoughts throughout, which is actually, um, which is actually really a nice point. Okay, so with two minutes to go, I would like you to um, talk very quickly about Simone Weil. There's a quote you use at least twice in the book. Um, and I think you mentioned in the book that you would have used, used it for the title if Princeton had let you. And I thought it would be a nice note um, to end on. So could you, could you share the quote with us? Um, that's great. Yes. Um, I, for the longest time, um, the working title of the book was Stars and Blossoming Fruit Trees. And uh, I, it was nixed and I fought for it and I lost. And then, uh, and then I wrote an article where I put it in there as the end and it was cut by my editor. Um, but the quote is, uh, stars and blossoming fruit trees, utter permanence and extreme fragility give one an equal sense of eternity. Very okay. beautiful. That's okay, I will, I will leave that in the chat also and I will turn it back to Catherine. Um, thank you for all of your, your link, linkage, Catherine, um, and for keeping the questions moving out of the thing. It's really lovely to be with you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff and Ada, for doing such wonderful work. It's really, I always love it when, like, events are by two people who, like, you can tell they're friends, but they also have a very nice mutual respect for each other. It's always nice to see. It's like, it's like, it's like I'm at a bar and I just happen to be eavesdropping on conversations. <laughs> Perfect. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Like we have all mentioned before, you can find this book in Praise of Good Bookstores at Pals at other independent bookstores by using the QR code in the back. Um, but you can shop wherever you can. Try not to buy from Amazon, but no judgment if you do. <laughs> but buy the book from us, buy from anywhere you can possibly gather it from. And thank you both so much for joining us. And we're going to be very excited to see you in June when your book comes out. Oh, yes. I will see you in person in June. I can't wait. Oh, All right, everyone, have a really good night. And we'll see you next time.
Thanks, Thank Catherine. you, Catherine. Bye, Jeff.